Announce to you that we have a father. The world had a father. Amen. And now all of a sudden he's our holy father. And we're pledging him our love and our allegiance and our loyalty and our prayer. Everyone says there hasn't been anyone like him. That's what's so fascinating. And people of all faiths want to touch yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Well, nice that's thing. an appeal too. Yeah. You know, we call him the holy father. Holy father, please forgive me. Holy father. You'll hear that title used quite often. This man, Bergoglio, Francis the Talking Pope, his predecessors, John Paul II, Pope Benedict, John Paul I, Pope Paul, Pope John XXIII, Pope Pius. You can go all the way back, folks. I'm talking centuries. These men are replacement gods, and these men have taken upon themselves the title of Holy Father. He wears the titles of God. He yes. wears the title Holy Father, head of the church. He never died for the church, but he stole that title from Christ. Jesus said, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Yet the popes took to themselves the name Holy Father, along with all claims of authority that might be assumed by such a title. Pope Innocent III, who fathered the Inquisition, said, The Pope holdeth place on earth, not simply of a man, but of the true God. Meanwhile, Pope Nicholas said of himself, I am in all and above all, so that God himself and I, the Vicar of God, hath both one consistory, and I am able to do almost all that God can do. I then, being above all, seem by this reason to be above all gods. Nicholas even claimed that the popes had the power to change the gospel itself, saying, Wherefore, no marvel, if it be in my power to dispense with all things, yea, with the precepts of Christ. But in the Bible, Jesus says, Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, and no man openeth. The Apostle Paul warned that, If any man or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. Yet despite these biblical warnings, the popes repeatedly claimed they were equal to and above God, and were even called by Catholics our Lord God, the Pope. The Lateran Council, while addressing Pope Julius II, said to him, Take care that we lose not that salvation, that life and breath which thou hast given us. For thou art shepherd, thou art physician, thou art governor, thou art husbandman, thou finally art another God on earth. In the 19th century, Cardinal Giuseppe Sarto, who would later become Pope Pius X, declared, The Pope is not simply the representative of Jesus Christ. On the contrary, he is Jesus Christ himself, under the veil of the flesh. Does the Pope speak? It is Jesus Christ who is speaking. Hence, when anyone speaks of the Pope, it is not necessary to examine, but to obey. Jesus said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yet Pope Pius IX blasphemously declared, I alone am the successor of the apostles, the vicar of Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life.
The popes have not only made claims to be God, but have insisted that salvation itself depends directly upon obedience to them. Pope Boniface VIII said, We declare, say, define, and pronounce that it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman Pontiff. Pope Clement VI said, No man outside obedience to the Pope of Rome can ultimately be saved. All who have raised themselves against the faith of the Roman Church and died in final impenitence have been damned and gone down to hell. Even in modern times, Pope John XXIII in 1958 declared, Into this fold of Jesus Christ no man may enter unless he be led by the sovereign pontiff and only if they be united to him can men be saved. In 1984, Pope John Paul II was quoted as saying, Don't go to God for forgiveness of sins. Come to me. The quote was based on a Los Angeles Times article which reported, rebutting a belief widely shared by Protestants and a growing number of Roman Catholics, Pope John Paul II dismissed the widespread idea that one can obtain forgiveness directly from God. Furthermore, according to traditional Catholicism, obedience to the papacy is said to be required, no matter how dreadful the Pope might be. Catherine of Siena, one of the patron saints of Italy, whose mummified head is still preserved in Rome today, said, Even if the Pope were Satan incarnate, we ought not to raise up our heads against him, but calmly lie down to rest in his bosom. He who rebels against our Father is condemned to death, for that which we do to him, we do to Christ. We honor Christ if we honor the Pope. Such demands for blind obedience were confirmed by the popes themselves, but confronted by the reformers. By men like Martin Luther, who said, The pope, possessed by demons, defends his tyranny with the canon, See Papa, or Yes Father. This canon states clearly, if the pope should lead the whole world into the control of hell, he is nevertheless not to be contradicted. It's a terrible thing that on account of the authority of this man, we must lose our souls, which Christ redeemed with his precious blood. Because of this evidence, Luther declared, I believe the Pope is the masked and incarnate devil because he is the Antichrist. It is important to understand that this belief was not just confined to Luther, but was held by all the reformers from John Wycliffe in the 14th century to Charles Spurgeon in the late 19th century. Spurgeon said, It is the bounden duty of every Christian to pray against Antichrist. And as to what Antichrist is, no sane man ought to raise a question. If it be not the popery in the Church of Rome, there is nothing in the world that can be called by that name. The Westminster Confession of Faith, along with the Savoy Confession, the Old Baptist Confession, and the Methodist views of John Wesley, all included the declaration that the Pope is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalteth himself in the church. This was also the belief of the men who translated the King James Bible. In their opening dedication, they commended the king for writing in defense of the truth, which hath given such a blow unto that man of sin as will not be healed. The view of the Antichrist, not as a single man, 
but of many men in a single office, was based in part on the teaching of John Wycliffe. In the Gospel of Matthew, the disciples asked Jesus, What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Wycliffe believed that the many who say, I am Christ, are in fact the popes. The pope's title, Vicarius Christi, literally means another Christ. Wycliffe concluded that Antichrist is thus a monstrous composite. In further explaining the Pope's title, author Dave Hunt writes, the Latin equivalent of the Greek anti is vicarius, from which comes vicar. Thus, vicar of Christ literally means antichrist. But the view of the papacy as antichrist is not widely held by Protestants today. Still, there are those who continue to uphold the Reformers' original beliefs. Permit me to say how much I... official Vatican portrait of the current Pope. It is called The Truth, The Way, and The Life, Portrait of His Holiness, Pope Benedict XVI. But can this really mean that in the modern world there are some who still believe the Pope to be equal to Christ and God? Mr. President, final question. Yes, sir. You said famously, when you looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes, you saw his soul. Yeah. When you look into Benedict XVI's eyes, what do you see? God. Good way to end the interview. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Sir. We want to show you some extraordinary pictures which came to us from the Vatican on what was of course an extraordinary day. Within hours of Pope Benedict announcing that he was to resign, take a look at this. Lightning struck St. Peter's Basilica, you can see it again now in slow motion. Lightning struck St. Peter's Basilica twice immediately following the resignation of Pope Benedict the 16th. Now, some people might not make anything of that, but lightning is something in sacred literature that uh, almost always carries spiritual connotation. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's evil, like when Jesus referred to Satan as falling like lightning. Um, and I can't help but think that the timing of two lightning bolts on this particular building, the St. Uh, Peter's Basilica, at the Vatican at the exact time following Benedict's resignation, I felt that it was mathematically improbable of chance. First, first because two bolts, I don't, you know, again, what do you make of, of coincidence and numerology, but we know that in sacred text and in scripture, these kind of things would be interpreted as signs and omens. At the start of Lent last year, Jorge Mario Bergoglio was just a face in the crowd. Today, Pope Francis is the most talked about person on the World Wide Web. With days until the Holy Father makes his first ever visit to the U.S., his popularity has taken off. We were able to walk right up to the stage yesterday, which is literally set at this point. You saw that there are thousands of seats already lined up as well. As you can imagine, hundreds of thousands of people turned out to see and hear Pope Francis today. And it was a mammoth effort. Philadelphia transformed into an outdoor cathedral. It's like being at the Super Bowl. The style was different almost immediately. The thousands before him as he bowed and said, Pray for me. 
And suddenly there was a connection with people. That set the tone for this papacy. Not more so people can actually relate to him. Absolutely. And bring more people into the church. Mm -hmm. more, more of a user-friendly public. Yes. <laughs> That's what we need right now. We've needed for a while uh, a renewed image, a renewed face of the church, and Pope Francis is giving it to us. The one man who is winning in every poll you look at, the Pope. His Twitter account, at Pontifex, ranks in the top five most searched words on the internet. Take a look. Look who's got his very own rookie baseball card, Pope Francis. Pope is even showing up on pizza boxes. Every trip he takes, Pope Francis has been met by adoring masses of the faithful. This week, he's been called a Catholic rock star. He's kind of a rock star, Time's Person of the Year, the cover of Rolling Stone. Now there's even a Francis fanzine. He's captured the imagination, not just of the world's 1.2 billion Catholics, but the world itself. I get it on the streets. I mean, everybody from the bartender to the cab driver telling me, uh, Cardinal Dolan, we love this guy. He's been called the people's pope. The papacy is saying, I'm a follower of so-and-so. You see people going out and, and giving the rock star treatment and fawning and fainting and screaming and everything when a pope goes by. I mean, he's just a man. Humility has made the former Jorge Bergoglio a star far beyond the Catholic Church. And became one of the most popular religious leaders of our time. You can't be a Catholic without acknowledging Pope Francis as the representative of God on earth. Chi ritiene di poter avere un rapporto personale, diretto, immediato con Gesù Cristo, al di fuori della comunione e della meditazione della Chiesa. Sono tentazioni pericolose, sono tentazioni dannose, sono, come diceva il grande Paolo VI, dicotomie assurde. Pope Francis has worked tirelessly toward a new world religion in which all denominations are brought together as one. If you look at Francis's outreach over the past three years and specifically in 2016, you'll find somebody who has openly condemned evangelical Christianity and the belief that you must have a personal relationship with Jesus. He has openly warned that this belief is dangerous. He has also equated the spread of the gospel under evangelical Christianity to jihadism. In the meantime, he has done quite a bit of outreach to every other religion in the entire world. Why is this happening? The extent of Francis's outreach to other denominations in 2016 alone has been mind boggling. In February, Francis held an emergency meeting with Patriarch Kyrill of Russia for the first time since the 1054 schism. Kyrill then went directly to Antarctica, where he performed a bizarre religious ceremony, consecrating the land and water surrounding the continent. Francis has also done outreach to Patriarch Bartholomew of Turkey, in which both leaders voice support for the migrant crisis and called for more migrants to enter Europe. In May, Francis met with Al-Azhar of Egypt, who is the head of Sunni Islam. In January, Francis became the third pontiff ever to visit Rome's major synagogue. He has also hosted Jewish religious and political leaders at the Vatican. In June, Francis outreached to the Armenians in July, Pope Francis visited Poland and told all of the young people in the audience to, quote, believe in a new humanity. Qual, Maria? Una mestra de vita spiritual. A puenton, una santigna a quen se recorre, prauter favore. The Pope sat before the image of the Virgin and recited the prayer that is most notably known in Fatima, the Rosary.
She's called the United Nations International Pilgrim Statue of Fatima and travels around the world. I've seen people who break down in tears as soon as they look at the face. The faithful believe they're seeing the face of Jesus' beloved mother Mary. The theologians say it's called the aura of the mother of God around it. That means the mother of God's presence is with that image in such a way that you can look at other images of Our Lady and get your fill. It is one of the, like say, the four original statues made under the guidance of Sister Lucia, the oldest of the three children. The three children, Lucia, Jacinta, and Francisco, said they saw an apparition of Mary while herding sheep near the village of Fatima, Portugal, May 13, 1917, and she revealed three secrets to them, including the prediction of World Wars I and II. And this is the face Lucia described. When you're looking at it, you feel her presence. You can get your fill at looking at other beautiful images, but you cannot get your fill at looking at this. You just want to look, look, and look again. Just a Mary shrine here, Mary shrine there, Mary shrine here, everywhere. Why do people praise and worship Mary, whom Jesus was born of? A famous Catholic bishop and writer, Alphonsus Liguori, explained in his writings that it is far effective to pray to Mary than to Christ. In the Franciscan Chronicles, it is related that Brother Leo once saw a red ladder, on the summit of which was Jesus Christ, and a white one on top of which was his Most Holy Mother. And he saw some who tried to ascend the red ladder and they mounted a few steps and fell. They tried again and again fell. They were then advised to go and try the white ladder, and by that one they easily ascended. For our Blessed Lady stretched out her hand and helped them so they got safely to heaven. The story which was made by the exuberant imagination sounded plausible. Although it was a man-made story, Pope Gregory XVI canonized Liguori as a saint, and Pope Pius IX declared him a doctor of the Catholic Church. Now Catholics are taught that it is better to pray to Mary, who is merciful and understands us. We must never go to our Lord Jesus except through Mary, using her intercession and good standing with Him. We must never be without her when praying to Jesus. The plausible logic that Jesus cannot refuse Mary's request because she is his mother is shown well even through the image of Mary and baby Jesus. In most cases, Jesus is nested in Mary's arms as a baby. This downgrades Jesus to a little baby who is always dependent on Mary and lets people think that he can do nothing without Mary. They call Mary the mother of God, which implies that she is above God. Mary as a female is merely a creation who was chosen to conceive Jesus. Mary worship of the Catholic Church reminds us of the mother-child worship of ancient Babylon. Just as Semiramis artfully spread the mother-child worship throughout Babylon, when she ruled it over instead of her son Tammuz, the Catholic Church now makes people worship Mary, not God, by accepting the mother-child worship from Babylon. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is... There is no trace of suffering or even joy in this Mary's face. But it is not the alabaster emptiness of her gaze these people see as they pray. It is the Mary whose pain, 
at the loss of her son, Jesus Christ, resembles their own. Mary's role for us as Christians is humanizing. It's somebody that we can relate to. 20% of all Roman Catholic places of worship in the United States, nearly 4,000, are named for Mary. Shortly after the Council of Ephesus, which was in 431, when they declared her to be the Theotokos, the God-bearer, Mother of God. And then everything changes, and she starts to appear enthroned with a child on her lap, with angels and saints around her. That is when she becomes important. By the Middle Ages and Renaissance, paintings of Mary could be read for symbols of her holiness. Her outer mantle is blue, and underneath she usually, not always, has red robes. She wears a dark blue coat, and she stands on the half moon. She is the mother of all gods. So, the ancient religion of Babylon, they all have one thing in common, the sacred feminine. The sacred feminine. The sacred feminine. Ishtar, the Babylonians, Tyre, the Buddhism, Fatima, Muhammad, Sophia, the Gnostics, Shekinah to the Kabbalist Jew, Mary to the Catholic, and Shakti to the Hindu. These all have one thing in common, the sacred feminine. And the sacred feminine is going to take you back to the source of light because the light that resides in that place that Plato talked about you need a path to get back to that light. Listen, this is important. She is the one to take you to that light. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a guess. Tell me this morning, who do you think that light is? You remember what this subject's all about? Lucifer. He's the light bearer. There's a wind blowing through this church today. And that wind comes from Lucifer. Yes, <laughs> it is that has brought him into the house, and he's now in power. No doubt about it, Lucifer is the prince, and he has now a place within the central citadel of the church. A lot of priests uh, like to perform themselves the satanic masses around Rome, and they perform them in the area where usually the Pope goes on holiday, near Castel Gandolfo, in the area where you have uh, also Lake Nemi, in those uh, forests around there, they perform the, these, uh, these black masses, and there is a Catholic priest who acts as a satanic priest, because the moment in which they act as a satanic priest is the moment in which they can really liberate themselves uh, of all their perversions. They can uh, do drugs, they can uh, go with the women, with men, with everything, and they can do all, all kinds of things. So the, 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 the sex cults are very powerful, like, for example, CNN is showing that at the Termini station there is a lot of uh, uh, prostitution from uh, minors, from uh, young kids. Well, uh, there was a scandal here in Italy in, uh, at a certain point in uh, 2013, I think it was June 2013, it went on the news for two days, then it was erased. They go into this my bar and in these places around the Termini station. Uh, to pick up these young kids. And then they used to have these ambulances, these fake ambulances parked in front of Termini Station. And they used to pick up these young Romanian kids, 14-year-old kids, and bring them directly into the Vatican. As an exorcist, when you do exorcisms, minor and major, the demons constantly taunt you with the condition of the church. They say, well, we're in St. Peter's. We can talk to whom we like. We have representatives sitting beside your Pope every day. What are you talking about? We are legit. I'm quoting demons now. This is what he said to you. How dare you? And our Prince has been enthroned, installed. And you're still against us? What are you trying to persecute us for? And so we have to understand that there is a Luciferian faction, a very strong Luciferian faction within the Holy See, not exclusive to the mm -hmm. Holy See. This is a dark brotherhood that exists. These are the mystery adepts. 
that have existed. They're, they're, they're following a lineage that goes back hundreds of years, actually that goes back to the Tower of Babel. Once upon a time, a long time ago, there lived a man named Nimrod. Nimrod was the great grandson of Noah. He was the most popular man on the earth at the time. Matter of fact, he was the king of the then known world. He was responsible for building the cities of, of Babel and all, the Tower of Babel and the city of Nineveh amongst others. Well, all that being aside, Nimrod no doubt had tremendous influence among the people that he was with. And what happened was uh, he had this uh, uncanny uh, reputation of strength. Uh, he created great uh, armies and uh, he, he was the ruler of the then known world right after the flood. He was full of idolatry and covetousness, drunkenness and uh, rebellious, rebelliousness towards God. And he had a phenomenal ability to deceive. Matter of fact, I suppose he was much like, a, I guess, an early politician 4,000 years ago. But Nimrod married a woman named Semiramis. Now Semiramis and, and Nimrod would became basically king and queen of the then known world. Well, at some point, Nimrod dies and he became deified. He was the very first person that was ever deified on planet Earth. And they made him the sun god, which ended up being Baal. The word Baal in your scriptures can be traced back to Nimrod. So it's an interesting uh, reality of history when you see Baal and Ashtaroth, you're ending up coming all the way back to this story of Nimrod and Semiramis. And so Baal is now ruling the universe as the sun god and somehow luck has it through the Babylonian legend that Semiramis gets pregnant by the rays of the sun of her deceased husband Nimrod. And she gives birth to a young baby boy named Tammuz. Semiramis, Nimrod's wife, insisted that Nimrod became the sun god. She cut Nimrod's dead body into pieces and sent them to each tribe of Babylon. People regarded the place where a part of Nimrod was buried as sacred. She also claimed that Nimrod was reincarnated as her son. As Semiramis ruled over Babylon in place of her young son Tammuz, she maneuvered people into worshiping her. Monuments of Semiramis carrying her child Tammuz in her arms were set up all over Babylon, along with various images symbolizing the sun god. The sun worship and the mother-child worship, which was a scheme devised by Semiramis, put down roots as a religion of Babylon. Idolatry stemmed from Babylon spread to many countries after the Tower of Babel collapsed. It is because when the Babylonians were scattered over the whole world, they brought the sun worship and the mother-child worship. The sun worship and the mother-child worship were assimilated into the cultures and religions of many countries and they came to have various forms and names. Nimrod, the sun god, was known as Mithra in Persia, Sol in Rome, Ra or Horus in Egypt, and Apollo in Greece. Semiramis and Tammuz, who were the start of the mother-child worship, was called Isis and Horus, Venus and Dionysus, Diana and Attis, and Astaroth and Tammuz, respectively. Besides these, the image of goddess, who is holding a baby in her arms, was venerated in many countries of the world. If so, was the mother-child worship the creature of an age, which was especially welcomed only in Babylon? Surprisingly, the mother-child worship of Babylon has been passed down through the thousands of years and still exists today. In Vatican of Rome, we can find the mother-child worship in its original state. Now, further down in the story, as Tammuz grows and becomes a man, Tammuz actually marries his mother, and they have a very uh, sexual relationship. 
And that baby Tammuz and his mother Semiramis is where you get the story of Cupid. Cupid, it, during Valentine's Day, is how the story of Valentine's Day developed was from uh, Tammuz, who married a, a very uh, unbiblical relationship uh, with his mother. Okay, back to the story of Tammuz. So Tammuz, for 40 years, was a tremendous hunter, and he took the place of his father, ruling the world, and had tremendous power. But more than anything, he was a credible hunter. But unfortunately, his gift and his skill of hunting caught up with him one day because he was killed during his 40th year by a wild boar. Every spring, uh, the first Sunday after the vernal equinox, the spring equinox, they have what was called Ishtar's, uh, Ishtar's Sunday. And they would have a sunrise service. At the sunrise service, the priest of Ishtar uh, would impregnate young virgins on the altar and during that same service they would take the babies that were now three months old from the previous year and they would sacrifice those children on the altar to Ishtar and then they would take the eggs of Ishtar and they would dip those eggs in the blood of those young infants and that is where we get sunrise services and uh, that is potentially where we get the dying of Easter eggs. It is also interesting to note that worldwide universal color of Easter eggs is red. Even the White House, the official color of the White House Easter egg is ruby red. Now, back to Tammuz. Tammuz gets killed by a wild boar. So every year in commemoration of celebrating the death and the deification of Tammuz, which became the son of God, the son of his father, they would set aside 40 days prior to Easter in, and they would fast and they would pray and they would have a giant feast on Easter Sunday where they would celebrate the, the death and the resurrection of Tammuz. And guess what they would have for dinner on that Sunday evening? You got it, Easter ham. They would kill a boar in commemoration to Tammuz, who was killed by a wild boar. And yes, the 40 days prior to Easter, uh, we call it Lent, or the Catholics call it Lent, that 40 days did not come from, my friends, the 40 days of Jesus in the wilderness. That 40 days was already in place for thousands of years before Jesus even showed up. It comes from the 40 days of fasting and praying for Tammuz before they celebrated Easter. I'm going to give you some of the names and, and what they're most commonly uh, remembered for in these different cultures and some of you will recognize them immediately. First of all, in Egypt they were known as Isis and Osiris. In Phoenicia they were recognized as Asheroth and Baal, the very same Asheroth and Baal that you see in the scriptures. In Greece they were Aphrodite and Adonis or Eros, where we get the word erotic from. And in Rome, they were called Venus and Cupid. That's right, that's where we get Valentine's Day from and Cupid. Even in the Far East, listen to this, this is amazing, Cupid was known as Zoroaster. Zoroaster is made up of two words, Zoro, which means seed of, and Asheroth, which is Easter. And so what Cupid actually means in the Far East is the seed of Easter, or the seed of his mother, Tammuz and his mother, Semiramis. If you look on your screen, you're going to see Isis and Osiris, or this is Ishtar and Tammuz. Now, some of you may be uh, asking, well, wait a minute, uh, I celebrate Easter, you're talking about Ishtar. Easter is actually the Anglicization of the word Ishtar. In other words, if you say Ishtar in English, it's pronounced Easter. That's how the etymology of that word evolved over time. What I want you to see is I want you to see what's on her head is a crescent moon, and in the center of that crescent moon is the actual sun itself. And so the symbol of power of uh, Isis, or Ishtar, was the crescent moon holding the sun itself, her deceased husband, Baal, the sun god. And you can see the baby there that is nursing from her breast. 
Ishtar was known as the goddess of the east, the bare-breasted fertility god of the east, or the sunrise, which is why they had the service at sunrise on Easter morning. Here on your screen, you see a pagan carving of the solar deity Baal Hadad, depicted as a disc in a crescent. Okay, you can see the, the half moon disc there in the center of your screen with the, with the sun that is cradled inside of it. And that is the sun god, as well as the, as the crescent moon that, it, that surrounds it. Now, as you see that the main symbol for the sun god was the crescent moon with the sun on the top of it or centered and cradled inside that crescent moon, we now move to something that's a bit controversial but very true historically is the Catholic Eucharist is actually the sun that is inside of that crescent moon. I'm going to show you some pictures of the actual Eucharist in different positions and you're going to see that not only is it similar, it's identical. This is where they got the symbols from. You can see here, this is a particular object that holds uh, the Eucharist and I found this online and this is what the quote said. I left off the particular church for obvious reasons, but this was their advertisement for a particular Friday. It says, Eucharistic adoration is held on the first Friday of every month for the purpose of honoring and praying to the Blessed Sacrament. Now, I don't know about you, but my Bible says to pray to the Father, our Father. Yeshua, Jesus said to pray to the Father. He did not say to pray to inanimate objects, whether they represent Him or not. Now look very carefully at on the right hand side you can see the moon, the crescent moon shaped holding that sun or that wafer of bread. Here's a close-up of it right here. The crescent moon cradle with the sun-shaped monstrance of the Roman Catholic Church. And now you'll see that it's actually the rays of the sun go all the way around this. They didn't hide it at all. Why did they hi not hide it? Because this is thousands of year old. This comes right out of paganism and sun god worship where it was the symbol of Baal and his wife Ishtar. And right here you can see the pine cone staff is another symbol found in paganism that's connected with the sun god uh, coming out of Egypt, Osiris. It's kind of in a form of a pitchfork you can see where the pine cone is in the center. Now why did they choose a pine cone? Because a pine cone represents pine cone symbolism, another um, very popular piece of symbolism for people who consider themselves, quote, in the know. That they consider that they are spiritually aware and enlightened, they have the knowledge, they are awoken, they have wisdom, and they have transformed themselves spiritually. In many cases, it's the exact opposite. Uh, the, pine, the pine cone symbolism comes after the pineal gland, which is at the center of the head. It's uh, right here, circled in red. Um, it's uh, considered in the midbrain or the limbic system of the brain. Um, it regulates, uh, this gland regulates a lot of different functions within the individual related to perception, emotion, etc. And the gland looks like a little pine cone. It has uh, a lot of blood flow that goes through it, and it's very much attacked as something that they don't, they seem not to want to develop or function properly. So a lot of the food, things in water uh, are very much attacked to target this part of the central nervous system. Uh, the pine cone literally looks like a little pineal gland. Okay, the pineal gland looks like a little pine cone, I should say. This is called the court of the pine cone, and it is at the Vatican. That's where that pine cone is at. It is surrounded by two peacocks. Peacocks are another big symbol in alchemy. They represent alchemical transformation. Again, the pine cone represents awakening, resurrection, or transmutation, spiritual transmutation. Now below it, there is a black empty sarcophagus right down there below on the left-hand side. Uh, as you go up these steps in the port of the pine cone to the other side of it from this image perspective, that's what you will see. And behind it, there is an empty sarcophagus. Now they're basically throwing this symbolism right in your face. You know, we are the resurrected ones. We are the ones who have come out of darkness and into light. We have the knowledge. We understand how the awakening process works. We understand how this um, activity of the brain 
that people don't even understand and whose functions are essentially shut down due to the horrible nutrition and all kinds of pollutants in their food and water. We know how that works, you know, and we have, we have done that transformation to ourselves, but that's not for you. You know, we're gonna sequester that and keep it to ourselves and keep it here. And they never mention this. You'll never hear about this by the Vatican. But just go on Google Images and you know, you'll see tons of images of the type cord of the pine cone. You have a lot of tourist images that just take pictures of it. Of course, here you see the Pope in his uh, astrotheological regalia here. The fish head mitres that they wear mm -hmm. are the representative of the fish head mitres that were worn by the Sumerian priests and the priests of Babylon. The Abgal. Yes. That's they, right. Yes. They, ser and they served in the, in the temple of uh, a, a goddess named Nanshi. Yes, and it specifically references um, uh, what, what, what we, who we know as Dagon. Yes. Um, so, and he was known as Oannes to the Greeks. Yeah. And uh, this was, according to myth, an individual, a, a, a hybrid person, a half fish, half man thing that came out of the sea mm -hmm. and began to instruct mankind in the lost knowledge. But at the base of it is the pine cone right there in his hand. I circle it right there. In symbolic iconography throughout the ancient world, the pine cone is revered. It's always a symbol of the transformation of a god. Often the god is giving that spiritual essence or knowledge to humanity. Here you see it in the Akkadian tradition of one of their gods, a clearly non-human looking entity. Here it is in the Babylonian tradition because this staff goes all the way back to ancient sun god worship where it represented power and authority of the gods, you see. And this is a close-up of that staff right here where the pine cone is embedded right in the staff itself. Let's move on to another symbol. This is the symbol of the trident. The trident is a, a, the devil's pitchfork. It really is a symbol of Satan, of the horns of Satan. It's an ancient satanic and pagan hand gesture called the trident. We find this in archaeology all over the place. Whenever you get into any kind of society of sun god worship, you find the trident everywhere. You see it in ancient Babylon. It was placed in the hands of all the pagan sun gods. Now, all the pagan gods and pharaohs had some sort of trident, a staff, that they would be connected to power and authority of the gods. The most famous one, of course, is Neptune's trident. We call it the Devil's Pitchfork, and that's where it comes from. It's just not a drawing that someone made up. This has history built into it of where these things come from. Now, if you move forward in time, uh, or, or during the same time period, excuse me, you're going to find another symbol that is even more important. As a matter of fact, you're going to see two symbols in this picture. This is a pagan statue of Jupiter that has been renamed St. Peter. You also see what is baby Jesus, supposed to be J baby Jesus, is none other than baby Tammuz. And how do we know it's not Jesus? Because you see trident all over the place. You see the trident symbol in the hand of the infant Jesus, along with the tridents coming out of the statue's head. You'll see three tridents, two coming off the sides of the head and one coming off the top of the head. This is not baby Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. This is a pagan sun god, Tammuz, from the story of Baal, Nimrod, and Semiramis ended up being Cupid in today's Valentine's Day. And right here is the ancient Babylonian altar for the sun god Baal, and its main symbol is the eight-pointed star, which can be depicted as two four-point stars built inside of one another as the solar wheel. We see the same solar wheel sunburst over a Buddhist temple in Thailand. Here is a monastery uh, St. Ignatius, where the solar wheel or sunburst is depicted in the floor tiles. Here is the face of a child, which is of course Tammuz, within the fertility symbol of the sun's rays on a Roman Catholic altar. The same exact symbol is shown uh, in a face of the Babylonian sun god on a pulpit in a Roman Catholic church in Scandinavia. Okay, all this same symbol comes right out of paganism as I've shown. Okay, this is probably one of the most fascinating pictures that I have. Uh, I zoomed in to the Vatican using Google Earth and stopped several miles above. And, and look what we discovered is this is the largest solar wheel on Earth. This is the court of St. Peter 
at the Vatican in Rome itself, excuse me, the sun disk behind the head of this Roman Catholic statue in Westminster Cathedral in London, where did they get the idea of sun disks behind these saints? Uh, it's because this was what was found on, behind the head of Jupiter and all these sun gods uh, was the actual uh, monstrance of the, of the Roman Catholic Church. That, that halo is not a halo, that is a sun disk and they borrowed it from paganism. We see here behind Krishna another sun disk behind his head and this is just to show that it doesn't just happen in Catholicism, that the sun disk predates Catholicism by hundreds, even thousands of years. It was borrowed. We see it in stained glass windows behind all of the Roman Catholic saints, even Mary. And if you look carefully, you see the sacred heart, that sacred heart, even though I don't have time to go into this, even the sacred heart comes right out of paganism. That exact same symbol with the sun disk behind the sacred heart has to do with Baal and Tammuz, the sun gods. And you can see it all over the Roman Catholic Church and even in other pagan religions across the world. And where do we find this eight-pointed star, this solar wheel, this sun disk today? None other than on top of our Christmas trees. Now I know all of us have been taught that the star on top of the Christmas tree represents the star of Bethlehem that the kings came in to find baby Jesus. But unfortunately the star of the ancient pagan sun gods predates the star of the Christmas tree, the star of Bethlehem, by over a thousand years. They were taking the sunburst and connecting it to what you're going to learn in just a few minutes is the tree of Nimrod, and that is where we get our Christmas tree from and the star that we put on top. If you look carefully, you can see there is a tremendous significance and a similarity between the sunburst and the stars that we put up there today. Here's the sun disk proudly displayed on top of Christmas trees in, in a mall. Matter of fact, this one doesn't even hide the fact that it's not a star, it's the sun that you're looking at. Even the eight-pointed star on top of the White House Christmas tree for everyone to see is the same eight-point star that you, we find in archaeology thousands of years ago connected to pagan sun god worship. When do you think the birthday of Nimrod and Tammuz was? on the first day of the year when the sun is reborn. And what day do you think that the sun is reborn? In the middle of the winter, at this winter solstice, December 25th. That's right. That's where we get December 25th on Christmas Day where we say that Jesus was born. Why did we choose Jesus being born on December 25th? Where did that date come from? Very simple. Jesus was the Son of God. Tammuz was the son of the gods. He was the son of his father, Baal. And so the pagans, which early Christianity came right out of paganism in Rome, they were already worshiping the sun god on Sunday in Rome, which is where we get worshiping on Sunday from. All judges, city people, and craftsmen shall rest on the venerable day of the sun. Constantine's edict in 321 played an important role in making the sun god worship faith to put its roots down in the church. Many Bible believers today have followed tradition handed down by previous generations. They believe and were taught that Sunday is the proper day of worship. That the Savior changed the day of worship from the Jewish Sabbath to Sunday. The adoption of Sunday as the Christian Sabbath has little to do with the Bible and everything to do with Constantine the Great over 300 years after the Messiah's death. Constantine was emperor of the Roman Empire from 306 to 337 CE. He was a sun worshiper who on his deathbed converted to Christianity. In 321 CE, while still a sun worshiper, Constantine established Sunday as the day of worship. He decreed, on the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. In this coin circulated by Constantine in 317 CE, we see the face of Constantine on one side, and on the other the figure of Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun. The sun god was also known as Mithras, and his birth was on December 25th. This date was adopted as the birth of Christ, and became the date for Christmas many centuries later. 
Clearly, Constantine was an avid worshipper of the sun god Sol Invictus. Amazingly, Martin Luther, the champion of the modern-day Protestant movement, said, They allege that the Sabbath changed into Sunday, the Lord's Day, contrary to the Decalogue, as it appears. Neither is there any example more boasted of than the changing of the Sabbath day. Great, say they, is the power and authority of the church, since it dispensed with one of the Ten Commandments. Nowhere in the Bible do we see that Yahshua and his apostles changed the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. In fact, the Messiah in his Sermon on the Mount has this end time prophecy. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Those who were tainted with polytheism of Rome looked as if they had converted, but in actuality it wasn't easy for them to get rid of the religious rites and institutions of worshipping the sun, the moon, and the stars, and various gods and goddesses which they had worshipped since their forefathers. The church in Rome sought for solutions to disburden the pagans when they converted to Christianity. It was to bring in things similar to the gods that the pagans had believed into the church. They thought they would increase the number of pagan converts by doing that. For the Christian bishops introduced with but slight alterations into the Christian worship, those rites and institutions by which formerly the Greeks and Romans and others had manifested their piety and reverence towards their imaginary deities, supposing that the people would more readily embrace Christianity if they perceived the rites handed down to them from their fathers still existing unchanged among the Christians. To attract more pagans, the church in Rome tried to Christianize various kinds of pagan gods to suit the Bible. One of the most representative things among them was accepting pagan customs of the sun god worship tradition. The church in Rome identified Jesus with the sun god. Inside of the church was decorated with various kinds of sun images and the idea to worship the sun was established as if it were the truth of the church. In the last days, there will be a very convincing counterfeit of God's real church that compromises the truth of scripture. Jesus warns it will nearly deceive the whole world. The Vatican is secretly preparing for the arrival of alien saviors. They seem to be intentionally creating dogma that is going to position the Roman Catholic Church to be at the forefront of an official disclosure moment. The Vatican is involved in ufology in ways that they can't even imagine. So while we're standing here in the headquarters of the Jesuits, tell us about Mount Graham. They are constantly monitoring things with the Lucifer device. Sometimes they have to wait for all of the UFOs to get out of the way. I would like to tell you more about Zechariah's teaching. He told me, John Mario, one night I wake up and I saw an Anunnaki sitting on my bed. History is being repeated. The days of Noah are returning. The gods are returning to the earth to dwell among men and mingle their seed with the human race. Only the truth can prepare us for the lie that's coming. Shortly after this final deception, Christ will return, and he will come for a church that has been purified from all the false traditions and paganism. This spiritual war has been raging down through the ages, and it's clear that this prophecy is fast fulfilling. As the battle intensifies, we're all faced with a choice. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Soon. All will either join the Bride of Christ or follow the Beast of Babylon. Where will you stand? In this world, you're either serving Christ or you're serving Lucifer. 